Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our mini lecture for uh, today. I hope you had a good and relaxing spring break and you're more than ready to come back to our lessons. And we'll start the week by talking about sounding, sounding the public or the history of radio. So let's start with the first slide. So in this chapter, uh, the author discussed this notion of broad, uh, broadcasting as an idealized configuration among speakers and audiences that conjures vision of the public sphere. And the author also analyzed how radio officially became defined as an agent of public communication. So for this chapter, the author focuses on uh, the period of the 1920s because this is the period that uh, marked the beginning of the popularity of radio. And um, the heyday, the booming of the radio, um, will enter in the period of 1930s and 1940s. But because this is the, the beginning of the popularity, so there are many concepts, many terms that the author would like to explore um, in this chapter. So. Radio technology was first conceived as a means of point-to-point -point communication. It wasn't uh, meant to be as a medium that everyone can listen to. Um, so therefore, at the beginning, uh, people considered radio um, as a medium that has a huge amount of uh, disadvantage because unlike telegram or mail, it lacks in confidentiality. So uh, what we see here is that the reception of the signal, because everybody can listen to it, was inherently open-ended. And so there is this quest for a confidential channel um, at the beginning of the uh, development of radio. What was wanted at that time was the person-to-person -person communication and not a party line where everyone can listen to it. Um, so. In other words, what they were wanting to uh, do is this secured communication channel instead of this um, open to all the audience um, communication channel. So the term listening in, a verb used to describe audience behavior in commercial radio, even borrowed the notion of eavesdropping on party lines, um, as if rod, uh, radio audiences were overhearing messages not originally intended for their ears. And, and this is ex uh, interesting, as well as this idea of the term broadcasting was not embraced until wireless technology had been in use for a quarter of a century. So though the origins are obscure, the term is thought to refer to the scattering of seeds. And uh, I hope you understand that at the early conception of radio, people uh, refer to it as the wireless technology. I know that nowadays we have um, a different understanding of what wireless is with the Wi-Fi and internet. But at that time, um, when you hear the term wireless technology, we know that it refers to this idea of radio. So the discovery of radio as an agency of broadcasting is often attributed to David Sarnoff, which was the who was the future head of the National Broadcasting Company. So in this famous 1915 to 1916 memo, he described the wireless as a household music box because at that time um, it was considered as a medium for entertainment, entertainment, and so. Um, the way that they used radio was to broadcast um, classical music or popular music um, to, entertain in, uh, to entertain the public. So one obstacle was the questions of how to make money from a communication circuit that seemed to be a continuous gift to the public because everybody can listen in. Um, at that time, this idea of uh, creating radio advertisement um, had not been conceived yet. So he saw the medium lack of privacy um, as an opportunity rather than obstacle. Uh, and, he, you know, it developed later on the fact that 
you can actually make profits out of creating advertisement radio, radio um, advertisement on the radio. So eventually, radio became officially defined as an agent of public communication. And this is interesting, and I do want you to think about um, how is it that from the early conception to much later in the 1920s, uh, radio started to own this role. So the key question in the 1920s and early 1930s was its regulatory status. Was radio a common carrier or is it something else? Because broadcasting lack um, this the boy in the blue uniform who rings the doorbell and who brings the message itself. So it seems like uh, there's no a way for them to actually regulate uh, this new medium of communication. Um, and because by the standard of common carriage, broadcasting was a deformed communication circuit because there's no way for um, this board to actually regulate how this message get listened to by the audience. Uh, therefore, it could not fall under the jurisdiction of interstate commerce commission like shipping lines and railroads so uh broadcasting as legally defined by the federal communication commission involved privately controlled transmission but public reception whereas common carriage involves publicly controlled transmission if you imagine the um what is it railroad railroad uh, but private reception so if you're thinking about mail uh, service for instance it was uh, what is it Re receive or um, yeah accepted by private individuals and not by um, this mass of people so the communication act of 1934 thus installed the ancient notion of dissemination in the heart of modern technology in the guise of um, broadcasting so uh, basically that is uh, the gist of chapter 23 there are more information provided there and i do encourage you to finish reading it in order to be able to answer the lecture check questions that I'm going to ask at the end of this uh, mini lecture. So we're moving on to early radio from chapter 24. And here the author explores how the terms of radio listening were constructed, contested, and invented in the 1920s by programmers and listeners. Um, the author also discusses how radio shifted people's communication habit to listening and created this new idea of manhood and nationhood in the early 1920s. And this is so fascinating um, how radio as a medium can help shape uh, the nation's idea of what, you know, what is a nation, what do we consider as American, and also this idea of what makes um, men, men. So this idea of manhood. So radio allowed listeners to reformulate their identities as individuals and as members of a nation by listening in to signs of unity and signs of difference. And what the author meant by this, um, and she explained further, is the fact that in the 1920s in New York, um, there was this broadcasting uh, rule that's called chain broadcasting um, that enabled listener to tune in to centralize and standardize radio programming and at the same time listen to locally produced programs on independent stations so if the uh, one in the New York that we call it as the chain broadcasting is regulated the hours the type of programming now the more um, independently uh, run has it their own uh, programs and that makes this idea of uh, what we can listen as a nation versus what we can listen um, as part of the local communities become these competing ideas. So this shows represented national and regional or local culture. And in the debate about what kinds of shows and stations were better, we see tensions surrounding network radio's role as a culturally nationalizing force.
So the term listening in um, that we have discussed in the previous chapter uh, went through these three distinct but overlapping stages in the 1920s. So the first stage um, that you know, first coined between the 1920s, uh, 1920 to 1924, refers to the phenomenon called uh, deaxing, which is trying to tune in as many faraway stations as possible. So people at that time described using radio listening to imagine America as a nation more harmonious than it was, yet simultaneously reveling in uh, and embracing the differences. And then the second stage was music listening, while the last stage is actually the story listening. I would encourage you to read more about it in the uh, book chapter. And then uh, the rapid explosion uh, of this listening would not have occurred without the amateur fraternity operators, which later known as ham operators. So they were the first radio audience in early 1900s. And this amateur fraternity began to take shape between the 1906 and 1907 after the discovery that some crystals, yeah, like silicon, was an ex excellent detector of radio waves. So this discovery of crystal detector opened up radio um, to legion of boys and men who were basically hobbyists. So they're primarily white and middle class and they live in urban areas particularly uh, around ports, and they built their own stations in the bathrooms, attics, or their garages. So uh, popular culture at this time, like um, New York Times articles, celebrated amateur radio as an example of the ambition and really great infantive genius of American boys. We come to the end of the first mini lecture. Um, we have here, uh, lecture check questions and I have five questions that you can answer. I don't need you to answer all five of them. You just need to answer three of these five. You can choose uh, out of these five questions which one you would like to answer. And I will set up a forum discussion um, where you can participate in the discussion and answer these three questions. And I will continue with the second mini lecture right after this. Thanks, everyone.